we're here to worship you tonight, to praise you tonight, to give you the glory and honor and recognition that you so deserve. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here for the person next to us. We're not here to please anyone but you because you so deserve more than what we're able to give, but we're here giving you what we have. And I ask that you be glorified tonight in every word that's spoken, every interaction, every movement. I pray that it would just be to glorify you because that's what we were created to do. Our every breath, our every moment is, was meant to be glo glory to you, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity that you've given us every single day to come before you and just present ourselves as a living sacrifice for you, Lord. And I pray that we would truly begin to understand what that means. It's not for our own benefit. It's not for our own comfort. We're not here so that we could just have a good time. We're here to make sure that you are glorified and that we're walking in the way that you've set before us, Lord. And I ask your Holy Spirit to move tonight in every heart, every mind, every single person that's walked through these doors. I pray that they would leave changed, that they would leave with a better understanding of who you are and what's required of us since we've decided to follow you, Lord. I pray against any distracting spirit, any spirit of division, anything that would try to come into these doors and take away from what you have planned for tonight, we bind them up and cast them out right now in Jesus' name. You have no, you have no dominion here. You have no, there's no space here for you tonight. This, this is the Lord's house and he's the one that's in control tonight. Anyone who were to come in with a heaviness or a burden, I pray that you would lift that from them, that you would show them that life is not meant to be lived under some kind of weight but we're, we're meant to be free. You came, you sent your son so that we wouldn't have to live like the world does. I ask that you would just help people to understand that tonight and that everything that's done, everything that's said would be to glorify you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a minute to greet one another. Let someone know that you're super, super glad to see them in the house of the Lord and that they're in the right place. This is exactly where we're supposed to be tonight. I just wanted to take a minute to let you guys know about something that's coming up, that's going to come up uh, the first Sunday in April. Uh, we're in the evening, first Sunday in April, we're going to start offering a new life class. And before you get too excited, there's a caveat. <laughs> we're going to offer it this time. We may offer it again later in the year, but this time we're going to offer it for those who haven't taken it yet because I've had a lot of people show a lot of interest in taking this class, and we want to make sure we maintain uh, a more intimate setting. So we're offering it for those who have not yet taken it. Um, just a brief rundown of what this class is. If you haven't taken it, you should take it just off the bat. But it is an eight-week class that serves as a foundation or a baseline to Christianity. So it goes into um, <laughs> it goes into the basics of the Bible, history of the Bible, history of Christianity. It's an incredible class. It's eight weeks. Each class is about an hour long, and there's homework to be taken. Never once have I heard someone say they've taken this class and regretted it. It is a phenomenal class. It's amazing curriculum, and you will learn a lot. The youth actually are taking this class right now. I think we have two more 
this week and next week, and they will have taken this entire class. They didn't have to do the homework, but it's okay. So they've taken it, and they seem super interested in it. There is such good information. Um, really, it, it goes according to what we believe. And so if you have not taken the class, I highly recommend you take it. Um, and if there is a bigger interest for those who have already taken it, we may offer it again later in the year for those who maybe have already taken it but want a, a refresher. So I hope that you take it. If you plan to be there, if you plan to be at the classes, please let me know. Okay? All righty. So I want my teenagers. Let's go. Right on. Also, we have our Easter Easter service on the 30, March the 31st. You have your list of seven people that you're going to be bringing. Not that you're just bringing, but you're praying for them. You're inviting them, and you're bringing them. Um, ask God to prepare their hearts to not only just get here and come with you, um, but that the Lord would would touch their heart. He's going to touch their heart, but that they would be receptive to that. That's what we want. We're not here to uh, just hold a church service and have a 501c3, a charity. This is not, even though you may it may be called a, a charity or a 501c3, we don't operate according to the, the world system. We don't... Uh, operate according to what man or woman uh, want, but we operate according to the Word of God. And if that's not going to fly, then, then I guess you're going to have to take away our, our 5013 status. But um, uh, there was a God before there was a 5013 status, and there will be a God after the 5013 status uh, dissolves. And so um, on that, the... So King David, in the, in the word of God, we see where King David says, um, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Anyone know that one? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go where? Into the house of the Lord. Yeah. And um, the, the, the house of God is important. It is very important. It's where the church gathers. It's where we come together. All throughout the book of Acts, you see where they were meeting in, in like lecture halls. They were, they were meeting everywhere. Tonight, we're actually going to take a look at where uh, I believe it was Paul. He, he got kicked out. They, uh, <laughs> they rejected him. And, so, and then for the next two years after he got kicked out of that, that venue, he just picked up where he left off at another venue. I believe if, that's, if this is the one, he was preaching from like 12 to 3 every day for two years. Uh, before he moved on. And so there is something special that happens that takes place. And it, it, anything that God has created, anything that God has put together, the enemy is working hard to destroy. Um, but if, if, you, if you, as a, as a Christian, are operating, if you're operating according to the word of God, and um, you are following the instruction that God has given to you, no demon in hell or out of hell can do anything about what, what God is doing in and through your life. Right. Amen. 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 Yeah. And uh, see, the, the devil can't take anything from you by force. He can only deceive you to, give you, to get you to give it up for yourself. And uh, when, when, whenever you see someone who is defeated, it's because they're allowing themselves to be defeated. Amen. Amen. We have the word of God. We have the truth of God's word, and I've seen, I've seen it play out throughout my, I'm 47, seen it play out since I grew up, I was, I was born, of course, as we all were, and then I found myself underneath the, the organ bench as my mom was playing, of course, I don't remember those days, um, and I remember cutting my teeth on uh, the, the wooden pews, I remember, I remember what they taste like, they taste like people's hands mixed with cologne and fragrance lotion you could even see the dirt stains where people had their hands like during the service i remember what the, the hymnals taste like i grew up in the church i grew up in the church 
<laughs> and um, I've seen people who were moved by the Spirit of God, whose lives were completely changed. I, I, I remember seeing, um, and it's funny because the same thing's happening now that I'm the adult in the room, I'm the pastor. I saw when, my, when, I, was a, when I was young, I was like, like Mikey's age. How old is Mikey? Six. I remember looking up and my dad talking to, to women who, who were being abused by their uh, husband or their boyfriend. And remember my dad just like, and that, that woman would be so, just so sensitive to the, to the moving of God and be involved in the church and, um, and how uh, Satan would, was trying to do anything and everything he could to take that person, that beautiful woman, out of the church. And I was just watching. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I didn't know what my dad was talking about. I didn't know what he was praying about with, with, that, with those people. Um, but now I do. And the enemy is doing anything and everything he can to get you to forfeit what he has freely given to you. Imagine that. Someone giving you something of value. Of worth, you have a you have a treasure that you're carrying. Every single born again believer has a treasure that they're carrying, not just with them, but on the inside of them that we carry wherever we go. And the enemy is trying to get us to take that treasure that was freely given to us, take it out, and set it to the side. And when that happens, a hundred percent of the time, it's not a lottery. So hundred percent of the time, someone comes to Christ, they get their life back. They get life, eternal life. They get life in this, on, on this, uh, in this life. And in the same way, when you forfeit that, people forget because they get comfortable. They, they forget that the power wasn't in and of themselves. And the reason why they needed a Savior in the first place was because of their own sin, was because of their own uh, attitude, their own habits, addictions, that they put in their own lives, and then when they walk away from God, and sometimes it's super subtle. And check this out. Let me let me listen to this. This is I've seen this happen many many times. You you may think when someone gets defeated, they get defeated because of something that's negative and heavy and a burden. And ouch, ooh, I wouldn't want to go through that. But many people actually don't fall backwards; they fall forward. You see. Satan doesn't care how you fall as long as you fall. If he can discourage you and get you to fall backwards, that's great. But if he can't do that, what he's going to do is he's going to get your head so puffed up um, with pride, with, with um, self, self, selfish, selflessness, self, selfishness. How, I can't try to express self. Um, that you begin to forget about where your blessing came from. And you're allowing the blessings of God to create uh, d division and, and um, distance between you and God. And it bothers me when I hear people say, and I've heard this my whole life, um, that the reason why they can't uh, be at a place that they normally would be at, like in the, in, or an event in the, for the house of God, um, because of God, you know, God has just blessed me so much. That I can't be there. Yeah, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds funny. Um, but that's what happens. But that, in, that is the very, um, if you can nip it at the bud right there, if you can nip it right there at that moment, you're good. You can just keep, you know, carrying on <laughs> and get back right on track. Um, but if you've taken geometry, you know that uh, two lines, you know, if they're just 1%, just 1% of an angle, they may look like they're, they're parallel at first, but the further out they get, the further apart they become. And so that's why we say, that's why you hear me say, um, partial disobedience is disobedience. And so we can't allow the, the rumblings and the roar of the enemy to get us to fall backwards and discourage us. Amen. And at the same time, we can't allow the blessings of God to become a thing of, of where we think, that we've done this and in our own strength, our own power, our own wisdom, our own understanding, because all of that came after we gave our life to Christ. It came after, it was the blessings from God. So when, when we look at Abram, God told Abram to go. He was, he was living in his father's land. His father was a, like an idol maker. He had his own like store. 
where he would sell like gods, idols made of, of, of hand, of, of, with human hands. And God told Abram, I want you to go. I don't, um, he, he didn't tell him where to go. He, he told him which direction to go. And so the next morning, Abram packed up his bags, and he headed off, headed in the direction that God told him. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know where he was going to end up, but he was trusting God. And God made that man so wealthy uh, with riches, uh, silver and gold, cattle, real estate, land. And it wasn't in his own doing. It was because it was the prosperity that God had just handed over to him as Abram was uh, later would be Abraham. He followed the direction and the instruction of God. And it's the same way today. The moment we allow ourselves to dis, uh to be disconnected from the instruction that God has given to us. Um, that's a scary place to be. When you see it in someone else's life, um, you know, some, sometimes you can give a warning um, and you'll get different reactions, different responses. Sometimes they'll, uh, they'll get upset at you. What are you, like, what are you looking at? Look at your own stuff. Take care of your own stuff. Let me take care of mine. And when they say that, back off. Just, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I shared with you my heart. I, I love you. I just don't want to see anything bad happen to you or your family. You know, you, you, what you have is, is directly connected to the kingdom. And if you sever that, you're on your own, baby. You're on your own again. Um, then others uh, who, who hear it and heed um, will... They receive it. You've, you've won a friend. You've won a brother or a sister. You've won, uh, you've won them back into the sheepfold where, there's, where they're protected. You know, Jesus even left the 99 because they were where they were supposed to be. He went out and got the one. Uh, when you're in the sheepfold, you're where you're supposed to be. You're in the, the protection. Um, amen. So I want to share with you a message that I'm calling, The Lord has given you victory over all your enemies. There is not one enemy that you are not victorious over. And this is kind of like a hangover from, from uh, Sunday. Yeah. It's a, it, we're, it's a, it's a, I feel like it's just a continuation. This is something that we talk about. When, when you hear that word victory or see that word victory, we're talking about power. We're talking about authority. On Sunday, we were talking about uh, the authority of Christ. And because authority... Because Christ has the authority, he's, God the Father gave Christ the authority um, of, over everything in heaven and on earth. Like wherever your eye has ever seen, Christ has authority there. Um, it, our eyes haven't even been everywhere. You know, the, the oceans are probably the least discovered uh, place on the planet. There's so much under the water that we haven't even seen. Jesus has authority over everything that we have seen and haven't seen. And so Jesus gave us that authority. He gave it to you. He gave it to me. He gave it to us. And you don't have to be saved for, for three months, six months, 10 years or whatever to be able to receive uh, from the Lord um, healing. You know, at, 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 at salvation, you're, it's not a thing of where, okay, now, there's a 10-month a process that you've got to go through, this 12-step program that you've got to, once you get to that 12th step, um, th then, then you're free. Then you're saved. No, that's man's way of, of doing things. It's a, it's, a, it's a natural way of getting something done. But, but our God has authority over the supernatural. He has authority over those things that dominate men and women who have no answer uh, to, to, to that or no solution to that problem. But through Christ, um, he has the authority. And so what, whether it's demonic, whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, whether it's uh, social or relational, whether it's financial, what am I leaving out? Every area of your life. Because Christ has the authority, he has given his authority to us so that we have authority and dominion wherever we go, wherever our feet, wherever we find our feet, as long as we're following the instruction of God, 
You know, we're not go. It's not a thing because I've seen people take that scripture. Uh, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And they would, they would take it to mean that wherever I go, God is going to follow. But that's not the case. You're, <laughs> you're going to get your butt whooped. You know, but wherever you end up, whatever enemies are there, you're going to get, you're going to get, ouch. Um, so, <laughs> so the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So as he gives the instruction, as we go, the Red Sea parts. Without the Lord, the Red Sea stays the Red Sea. And I'm building a boat or I'm swimming. I'm get, I'm, it's, it's happening in the natural. But when the Lord is on your side, um, there, there, there is no uh, surgery that has to take place. Um, nowhere in the Bible, and, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not saying anything negative about uh, doctors or nurses or the medical industry because they're doing a wonderful job but but when you look in the in the word of god and you read the scriptures god never used a doctor to get done what he could do on his own on on his with it by himself amen he didn't need a vaccine he didn't need um pills meds prescription drugs he didn't need um some <laughs> remedy like Felicia made for me. She made me some, some uh, she was soaking some onions in some honey. And it tastes pretty good, actually. And it helped a little bit. Um, I'm not just doing my best. Uh, was it Robert? Robert Kennedy Jr.? RFK. Is that guy trying to be like RFK? No, no. Um, but the Lord can heal, He can provide. And he does. And the one thing that many people miss out on is that he actually wants to. So you can know that God wants, or you can know that God can heal, but if you don't know that he wants to heal, you'll begin to pray um, contrary to the word of God. You'll be, begin to say, God, would you please heal me or please heal my mom or please heal my son uh, if it's your will? Because I want your, and then God is saying, no, you just ruined it. My word is my will, my will. And there's, God doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to suffer. He doesn't want anyone to uh, go through sorrow or go through pain. And so obviously one of these days, all of us are going to breathe our last breath, right? That's just the truth of it. We live in this, this earth suit that one day will pass away. And the real you, your spirit, will live on for eternity. And if you had, have your faith in Christ, you go to heaven for eternity. And then also, so when Jesus comes back down to the earth to set his throne in Jerusalem, you will come to rule and reign with him um, in the new earth. That's, that's in the word. Um, but if you choose to go in your own wisdom, your own strength, your own power, your own authority, you're going to find that you didn't have any of that. When it comes to supernatural, when it comes to eternity, this physical flesh thing that we live in this this uh vehicle that we live in couldn't do anything for us in eternity and if we try to do it on our own we end up going to hell there's no ands ifs or buts about it there's no there's no purgatory there's no i've even i've had uh mothers message me and ask me to pray for their child who passed away and um that's that's a rough conversation, um, and I I, I I try to use discernment. Sometimes I don't even address the issue because it's just going to hurt them, and it's it's not the right time. Um, anyway, um, what I what I want to what I want you to to have and to take with you, not just for tonight, but for the the rest of your life, and pouring into your children, pouring into the people that you are around your world is that God has given you victory over all of your enemies. The Lord has given you victory over all your enemies. And let's go to um, 2 Chronicles, the 20th. No, go, let's go to Luke 4. Luke 4. Luke 4. Does the pastor know what he's doing? No. Nope.
And the Lord says, go in a certain direction, you just go. So we're going in a certain direction. Go to Luke 4, the fourth chapter of Luke. It's the third uh, gospel, gospel according to Luke. And one thing we must uh, remember is that because there are denominations, uh, different sects of Christianity that teach that once you're saved, you're always saved. And that, what that does, it, it leaves a, a cold and complacent church. It, it, so if, if what it does is it takes the responsibility out of my hands and it puts it on God. When God has put the responsibility on us, he's given us access to his kingdom, but we've got to walk by faith, right? We've got to follow the instruction or we don't get to receive the benefits that come from following those instructions. And so we, we have to stay on task. We have to stay the course and we cannot forget um, the instruction that God gives to us. We cannot forget that, that we are still dependent on him every day, every moment. In, in, um, in my relationship with my wife, I need the Lord. Uh, with, with, in my relationship with my children, I need the Lord. I do. There's never going to be a time when I don't need the Lord uh, to, to be my guide, to, to be, equip me and to empower me to do what he wants me to do. Because without him, man, was I a knucklehead. When I was a kid, uh, man... There was not a rock that I didn't pass by that I wanted to throw through a window um, and just destroy people's property. And um, no one knew. No one knew. I got caught a couple times, and I got spanked. I probably got spanked more than, I think I got spanked more than James and my younger brother, Trennan. Like, both of them combined, because Trennan was the angel. In quotes, if you're watching Trenton, I know you. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he likes the angel part. Um, and then James didn't hang out long enough to get spankings. Or, uh, so I, I got all of his spankings. Um, but we have to stay the course. I can't get distracted. Like I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. We can't get distracted by the discouragement. Because there's going to be discouragement. There are going to be people. There are going to be knuckleheads out there who say um, hateful things for no reason. They're going to say things to you, and if you're not if you're not aware that this is a thing, you may get knocked off your rocker. You may get knocked out of your shoes and completely devastated. You got to stay the course, even even when the blessings come, even when you you came to God with with negative. You were in the red. In your bank account, but now you're you're you got six figures in the bank. You've got a storehouse. Never, never do we use those things as an excuse of why I can't do for my God what He deserves. God, I, everything I have is because of you. I have a beautiful wife who loves me. God did. God gave her to me. And I like to think he also gave me to her. I think maybe. Um, and then um, <laughs> he gave me children. He gave uh, Felicia and I the ability to make other humans and to enjoy them. And so um, I'm, there's never going to be a point where it, it's not like I'm offering my children to the Lord. Just constantly just, Lord, what is it? And, you know, you, you see them up here. They want to be here. When I was their age, I was, I was forced to, to sing and to be on the stage. I didn't want to be up there. But Lyric and Lucas, eventually Sonny, um, they, they act like they want to be here. And so I'll, I'll take that as a win. Yeah, praise God. So in, let's, let's take a look and see what Jesus did um, when he was faced with opposition. Because realize that we are to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do when he was here? Did he? Was he a spectator? 
He was walking around. He was teaching, preaching, and healing. So when you say, or when, when we say you're to, you're to be like Christ, that's what we should be do, doing too. Spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we are in whatever we're doing. You know, you, you may not be a pastor or an evangelist, but wherever you are, you're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You are, uh, you are seeking the advancement, seeking first the advancement and expansion of the kingdom of God wherever you are in your neck of the woods. Because I'm not in your neck of the woods, and you're not in mine. We have this transition here where we're together as the body of Christ when, when we come together. But then you go to your house. I go to my house. We're not a cult. Even though, I, speaking of that, it was kind of funny. And I think other people were more upset than I was because I wasn't upset at all. Actually, I take it as a, like a badge of honor. This past week, I got called, like, on the West Sac community board. Like, all of West Sac, like, converges on Facebook here. And this person said, uh, called me a cult leader. And I, I feel like it's more harmful for you than for me, right? Like, because I, I don't care what people call me. But then you've dedicated your life to this thing where I'm the pastor, and where you, you have tied your finances, your children, your livelihood into what we're doing here. And so this knucklehead uh, just, and I've had experiences with this person in the past. And uh, just unreasonable, so unreasonable. Like, like, do you have a soul? I'm not sure. Um, and uh, in the past have been, has said, I've got video footage of, of people that go to your church. Uh, do, I don't know what it was, and I don't care. We're not here talking about people's sin at church. The focus at Joy Church is not sin, but it is the Savior. Our focus is on Jesus Christ. I want people to come in, and if you are, if you are just completely messed up, you're the one who be, needs to be here the most, Right? We're not running people off who are doing drugs or who are, are um, doing things they're not supposed to be doing. They're maybe even embarrassing things. But we're here. I'm here because the Lord saved me Amen. from a lot of stuff that we're just not going to talk about. You know, no one needs to know. It's between me and the Lord. There are some things that I will share, but then there are some things that you just don't need to know. And sometimes, as a, as a pastor, and I think you should think this too, I would rather people not share with me certain things. Um, cause I don't, I, and I don't do this, but I don't want to have any type of feeling or any type of thought in my head when I'm praying for you or when I'm talking to you. And um, I feel like I, I have pretty thick skin to a detriment. Sometimes it's in, in many many cases it's a good thing, but then there's other things where it's kind of like, well that guy seems kind of uh, rigid or e emotionless. Um, so the pros and cons, right? And so I don't allow things like people have uh, told me things one on one that they thought that I was going to kick them like out, like, and I'm like, that's not the first time I've heard that. I, you're not the first one to tell me something like that. You know, and they're, they're surprised. Um, and so what, what I'm trying to get across here is that we can't be distracted by things that we see, hear, taste, touch, smell. There is a kingdom that is in operation that we are connected to as born-again believers that is unaffected, un influenced by the things that are going on this on this in this world and if we are affected by it what we're doing is we're loosening our grip on the kingdom of god and we're now we're looking on things that we that are starting to distract us and so when when someone comes to me and tells me about something that's happening and i genuinely do not care that's because i'm more focused here than i am here this will be taken care of it, it'll resolve um, i'm not worried about People who are saying those things, actually, that's, that's, 
in many cases, the only reason you get things like that is because you're making waves. You're, you're, stirring, you're stirring the darkness. And, um, and many times the enemy knows, not many times, I think every time, the enemy knows more than we know. He doesn't know what you're thinking. He doesn't know your thoughts. Only God does. He knows the intention. But Satan doesn't know those things, but he can read body language. And he knows who the, the, the outreach team has been speaking to. He knows mothers who have been speaking to their children about God. And they know those children behind closed doors, what they're saying out loud. And what they're possibly what they're going to be deciding or contemplating in the future. You know, when the outreach team goes out, the outreach team and that person splits. They, 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 they go their separate ways. But Satan knows. He goes behind the closed door with that person. And here's the conversation with, hey, remember that? Remember you were saying how you wanted to go to church again? I just like randomly ran on to these guys that were super cool. And they, they were just super welcoming. And they have a church here in West Sac that I've never heard of, Joy Church. And I think we should go. Satan hears that. You didn't hear that. Satan heard it. And so what he's going to do is he's going to go after the person who is doing the footwork. He's going to go after the person who is speaking the truth in order to, to cut them off at the pass so, that, so that, that that doesn't happen again, so that God's church isn't filled. But it, it's... it's <laughs> a dance party. He's trying to, he, you're, you've got a target on your back, but don't take that as a threat. Take it as a badge of honor. Oh my goodness. This knucklehead thinks that he's got authority over the blood of Jesus. Let me go tell my friends about this and let's laugh about this knucklehead who thinks that, that the, he has authority over the blood of Jesus Christ. And what, what, what that does for me and what it should do for every believer is it should cause you to begin to double down. I'm creating, I'm creating a, a, a ripples or like a ruckus. I'm, I'm creating a stirring in, in, in the kingdom of darkness, and people are beginning to wake up. Um, the, the, the veil that has been put over their eyes is being pulled up, and now they're, they're, now they're asking questions. They want to know about this God. They want to know about this Savior. They want to know about this church. And the enemy is going to do everything he possibly can to stop that. How does he stop that? He doesn't go to them. He goes to you. And if you're allowing stupid things to discourage you, you're going to find out you're going to receive stupid results. Right? Did that help you to perk up your ears? But if you stand your ground, plant your feet in Christ... No matter what the enemy does, he fails every single time. Amen. And you get to continue to smile. You get, you, and you, what you're doing is you're, you're joining, uh, having people add even more friends, more brothers and sisters in Christ. Yep. And you can look over your shoulder and say, what do you think about that, devil? <laughs> and we're just getting started, bro. bro. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't think of the devil as someone who is over our God. We don't have an enemy who's greater than our God. We have a God who is greater than our enemy. Amen. Who isn't going to defeat him, but has already defeated him. And the victory that he won, he has given that to us. So we walk in victory. We're not going to see a victory. We are walking in victory in the moment. Amen. All right. We're trying, we're trying to get here. I have already quoted scripture, so, so we have had scripture, but we're going we're gonna to get into the fourth chapter of Luke now. Then Jesus, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Who was he full of? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Returned from the, uh, the Jordan River. Remember, what did he do in the Jordan River? He was baptized by John the Baptist. Holy Spirit drove him into the, the wilderness to be tempted. We see that in, in another gospel. 
2, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. So we see here that he was he was fasting. Thank you. He was also 100% man, but one also 100% God. He wasn't half man, half God. He was all the way man and all the way God. He was God in flesh, Emmanuel, the Christmas story. Um, Emmanuel, God with us. And so he took on flesh, and we see here that he had um, hunger. He had aches and pains. Three. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. So who was doing the tempting? The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Sounds reasonable. Jesus being God. Being hungry. But but what we see here is that if the whatever the devil tells you to do. Not only do you not do it, you do just the opposite. He's giving you a cue. He's trying to, it's like a diversion tactic. Like if he's making noise over here, look behind your shoulder because there's something. It's like like the government, right? They they create little ruckus over here. Look look over here. Don't look over here. And something's going on over here. We find out like weeks later. A diversion tactic. And this is what Satan, he's good at. He's good at that. But Jesus told him no. The scriptures say people do, n- do not live by bread alone, but by what? But by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In fact, let's go to Deuteronomy, the, the eighth chapter, to see where that, that comes from. We're going to take a little sidebar. Deuteronomy chapter 8, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 8. I want you to go home tonight knowing that you have the victory. Even if you have to step right back into what you stepped out of to get get here tonight. You still have the victory. I promise you that. And that's not my, it's not my guarantee to keep. It's, It's the Lord's guarantee. It's his word. He says here in the eighth chapter, God is talking to the nation of Israel. Uh, which isn't a nation yet, I don't believe. Uh, But in the eighth eighth chapter, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then, someone say then. Then. That's a condition. You're meeting a condition. Be careful to obey all the commands. That's the condition. Obey all the commands I've given to you today. Then you will live and multiply. And you will enter and occupy the land uh, the Lord swore to give your ancestors. So, the Lord is promising them if you continue to follow my instruction, the victory is already yours. You're not, you're, it's, you're gonna walk, you're gonna walk into the land and into those places with the victory in your hand already. If you obey all my commands that I'm giving you today. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes. He, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. People do not live by what? Bread alone. Food isn't everything. Rather, we live by or according to every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So, yes, I need food. <laughs> That just, that just keeps me alive. But the word of the Lord not only uh, keeps me alive, but it nourishes me and gives me eternal life. I'm eternally secure. Um, food can't do anything about uh, where I'm going or what I'm going to do when I get there. Food just, it's, it's nourishment to your body. But, so we don't, it's important, but it's not more important or take priority over what God is speaking to your life. God may give you bread, but we don't use that bread to justify why we're separating ourselves from God and what he's giving us to uh, instruction to do today. Amen. 
Because that's what we'll do. Stop bothering me, God. I, I'm busy eating. You gave me this bread. What are, you, what are you complaining about, God? You gave me this bread, so I'm going to eat it. That's what we do as humans. That's what we tend to do. But if God gives me bread and he says, hey, I want you to give half of that to your neighbor. And then I want you to split the, the next half with your worst enemy. And then the rest is for you and your family. Guess what? You're better off with that, with what God has given to you in that little portion than you would have been with the whole thing together. And so I, uh, like my dad used to say, I'm in the same boat. My, my, my greatest fear is being out of God's will. Like knowing what God wants me to do and not doing it. Because I may still have the provision, but that provision is, is going to run out. It's going to run dry because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, separating myself from the source. And so if God has blessed you, don't use that blessing as a way of excusing yourself from his instruction. Or because the blessings will stop. He says here, this is really cool. So he, you don't live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This is what Jesus quoted to the devil. He's just whooping him up, slapping him upside the head with the word of God. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. And your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child. The Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. He didn't say punish. He said disciplines. He's training them. He's, he's building them. You know, um, martial arts um, and even mi mixed martial arts. It's discipline. And the, the ones who are most disciplined are the best at their sport. <laughs> right? As any sport you go to, anything. The one who is most disciplined ends up having the best results. And so as the Lord is, is disciplining his children, the, the children of Israel, he's not punishing us. It's not wrath. It's not uh, spite. It's not hate. It's not judgment. It's not shame or condemnation. He's getting us to the place where he knows we need to get, where he needs to be, where he can, he can pour out his favor on us in right here. But if you're over there, it's not going to happen. And then in six, so obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. Have a healthy fear, awe, and reverence of God in a way that everything that you do is act of worship to him. You see, worship isn't just a song. It's not a tune. We've made it that way. People have done that so that we can uh, make it a corporate thing to monetize I don't want to ruin it for you, but monetize. So I'm not going to get into it, but uh, anything that's good, someone will take it. They'll find the pattern and the behaviors that work in that the industry or that thing, and they'll just duplicate it over and over again so that they can make money off of this thing that used to be good, and then it gets ruined because there's no creativity in it anymore. You know, we call it worship music when we're listening to it on like K-Love or whatever, but is it worship? Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that, that question with you. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't take the bread that God has given to us and use it against his kingdom but for his kingdom. Right on. Okay. Remember, I was in a punk rock band. Back in the day. Okay, go back to chapter four of Luke. So Jesus tells uh, the devil, he says, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then, so the, the devil isn't, he's not gonna stop the first time Maybe not even the second time, but we cannot be discouraged. We cannot uh, think uh, we're, we're 
As long as we're following the instruction of the Lord, we're in a good place. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. He's talking to Jesus who already has the authority, right? The devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please, I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only who? Only him. And so let's go to that reference there. I believe it's in Deuteronomy. Is it Deuteronomy 6? I go to Deuteronomy 6, 16, or go Deuteronomy 6, 16. We're going to start with Deuteronomy 6 and see where we're going to land there. Okay. So let's start with verse 14. You must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations. For the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. Because he can. You know, I've heard, heard people say, you know how many people God has killed? Like in the Bible? I heard a pastor say, he said, yeah, and they all deserved it. Don't put yourself in a position where you deserve the wrath of God. You have, that's your choice. That's our choice, right? 16, you must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa, when they complained. But you, in 17, you must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God, all the laws and decrees he has given to you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the, in the land, just as the Lord said you would. You see, the Lord has given you victory over all of your enemies. There is not one enemy that stands a chance against the, the born-again believer who is following the instruction of God, who is, who is a born-again believer. Blood, you've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, the more, the more you, you share the good news, the more you're going to see kickback from, from the enemy. You know, and don't look, don't look at the people, especially if they're family or, you know, loved ones as, as your enemy. Notice that, that your, 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 weapon, your, your, your warfare isn't against flesh and blood. It's not against them, but it's against that. It's, that, it's a spiritual battle. There's a battle going on, and many times people don't even know they're being used by the devil. They're being used by the enemy. They're not trying to be used. They just don't know that they've been, they're a great conduit for the kingdom of darkness to, dis, to try to discourage those who are speaking out. So notice, as you start, if you're not speaking out, you're not going to get any, any flack. You may even have people just super, like, love you. Not that they don't love you when you speak the truth, but... You know, all let just let's all come together and sing kumbaya. Like all religions, all you know, everyone who, who who wants to do what they want to do, let's just all do those things. But when you speak up and say, "No, this is what the Word of God says," I'm not going to do that. You're going to get kicked back, right? And so realize that 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 shouldn't discourage you, but then to keep keep speaking out. Keep speaking up the truth of God's word. Because if you don't go and, and share the word in your neck of the woods or in your part of the world, who is going to do it? Who's going to share the good news with your mom, with your dad? You know, we got a great testimony that brewing right now. You know, I, uh, with uh, different people that I've been talking to recently. Um. I even had someone uh, recently uh, reach out to me, doesn't go to this church. Said, hey, pastor, would you, uh, would you, uh, I'm not, I'm not as, as good as this as you are, um, but their, their parent was dying, being sent to hospice. 
and they weren't saved, would you would you would you send me the the the, the prayer of salvation that if if I if I get my parent to the to the point to where they'll 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 uh, receive Christ, I want to I want to I want to do it right. And so right away, yeah, I, I, I was like, it was like it was already in me. So I just like as I was going on my way, I just text the Lord, uh, not the Lord's prayer, but the, the sinner's prayer, prayer of salvation, and they thanked me. And um, I didn't hear the end result. I, I haven't heard. But um, that's the way we should be. We should be ready in season and out of season. We should always be ready to give an answer uh, when someone asks. And if you don't know the answer, don't be afraid to say, you know what? I don't know. Let me go look that up. I'm not, I mean, you're not, here to, you're not here, here to debate or to argue with anyone. Did Jesus argue with Satan? No. He just shared with him the truth. And then he moved on. So here we go. Let's go back to Luke 4, verse 9. So Jesus, he says, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him, uh, only him. Nine, then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. If I'm saved and I'm listening to the, to the podcast while I'm driving to work, I should be able to close my eyes and lift my hands and the Lord will protect me. No, that's a recipe for you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to go to heaven early. Lord, I thought you. <laughs> yeah. So Jesus, he could have done that, but that's not in his character. That's not why he came. Plus, the devil was the one telling him to do it. So heck no, I'm not going to do that. Jesus, he quotes scripture again. He quotes the word, who he is the word, right? Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, what did he do? He left him. Someone say he left him. So if you, if you don't give up, eventually the devil will. The devil will move on. He will move on to someone else. So we see here that the devil left Jesus. But notice what, what comes next. He says, he left him until the next opportunity came. So it's not that he's never going to come back. But when you resist the devil, the word of God says he must flee from you. So he will leave you for a time. Amen. And he has to. He has to. Then I want, to, I want you to see what Jesus did right, like right after this. And this is how we should, this is, so when you, when you get the most flack or you get the most kickback, this is when you should double down and put your afterburners on and make it hotter and, 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 and heavier. Notice what Jesus did. 14, then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. You're filled with the Holy Spirit's power as well. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual. Someone say, as usual. Where did he go as usual? To the synagogue on the Sabbath. So we see here that Jesus even went to the synagogue. He went to church. He found himself. So we even see this happen. Um, King David. So, like I said earlier, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How often? So um, King David also said, uh, what did he say? He said, one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And so that, that's before the book of Acts. That's before Jesus we see this desire. And I looked, I looked up the, the word temple. Um, I, I, just, I really, I was, because people say, oh, I have church in my heart. Or I have church in my home. I, I have church everywhere else except for the church. <laughs> and I, I wanted it so badly not to say uh, a physical place in, in the translation. And it's a physical place. King David was talking about a physical place to go to 
where I go to his house to go and worship him in his temple to inquire of him where I have questions that I know are going to get answered. Even if it's not a question that I have audibly, but it's maybe it's a question in my body or in my relationships that it's going to get answered when I go to his house. Amen. Amen. And that's what we're seeing here at Joy Church. We're seeing those answers, um, those questions being answered. We're seeing those, those, um, those burdens being lifted. We're seeing those sorrows being decimated. We're seeing weakness become strong. And it's a beauty to behold because it's the Lord's doing. And I get to sit back and watch it happen. In the church, we get to sit back and watch what God is doing. It's marvelous in our eyes where we just continually are awed. Oh, my goodness, God, that was like an impossible situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when the devil comes to you or you get someone calling you a cult leader, or someone just cussing you out or just trying to, because realize the devil can't take anything by force. He can only antagonize. He can only like poke and prod and get you to go in the, in the wrong direction. But if you know your assignment, man, I don't care what, what's in front of me. I'm going to walk through it knowing that my God is with me, Amen. that my God is fighting my battles. That my God is, is he's, he's going before me. He's preparing the place. B- before I even get there, it's already prepared. And, and many times I'll pray, God, like, I don't know what, 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 what's going to show up or what's going to be there when I get there. But, Lord, would you just prepare? <laughs> prepare my heart. Prepare whoever's heart is going to be there. Um, you know, when you walk into a hospital and, and um, a family is, is there and, they have a dying loved one on, on the bed, and you walk into that kind of like, what do you say? What do you do? You know? And God will give you the exact words to say. And it's not going to be some something that you, <laughs> like if you wrote it down before you got there, like, oh, why would I say that? But you don't know the hearts. You don't know the situation. You don't know maybe the complexity of the situation and how simple it is for God just to speak a word into that situation and everything, like whatever whatever uh, heaviness or weight was in that room, just poof, and all of a sudden there's a freedom. You know, and there's like love, people hugging each other and people uh, forgiving each other and asking for forgiveness. Amen. That's the, yeah. Thank you, Lord. And so we see Jesus, he's, he's, he found himself, as usual, in the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures, because that's what you do in church. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written in Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Can I hear someone say the time of the Lord's favor has come? In my life, in my family, in every area of my life. That's why the Lord came, to give you the victory. Not to see, he already saw the, the situation we were in. But he came to destroy every evil work of the devil. We read that on Sunday. Every evil work of the devil. He came and he, he got the victory over those things. And then he said, here, I just got this. I want you to have it. And he hands it to all of us. When we come to him, we submit. We, we, we stop clinging to our own lives. And we gain a new life. You know, the, the longer we cling to our own life, what does Jesus say? He says, he says uh, when you cling to your own life, you lose it. But if you will lose your life for my name's sake, you will find it. And those of you sitting in this room, you found it. You are walking in victory. You're not praying for victory. You're not praying for, for the enemy 
to lose his, his stronghold or to, to lose his grip on your life, he doesn't have a grip. Amen. He, he's like every day you wake up, he's, even in your, in your sleep, he's losing. Now act like it. Act like it. Walk in it. And so he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. It's like a, a mic drop. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. So they were like, are you done? Like he, he read from the scripture. You know, like th- this, this is what the scribes would do. This is what the, like the Pharisees would do, right? They would read the scripture. But there was a power that came when Jesus spoke. Have you ever, have you ever experienced that? You know, I guess, um, Ron, do you have like a daddy voice? Do you, do you have like a dad, like... <laughs> I know I have a daddy voice. No, like I'm talking like when they're in trouble. See, ma- mama has the, the, the baby talk. Actually, we've never talked baby talk in our house. So when people talk baby talk to Sonny, she's like. We talk to them like humans. Um, but daddy talk, like there's authority. Like, you better not do that again. Or even like, um, so sometimes I'll, they'll be in the other room like the kids, and I'll say, Sonny, get in here right now. And I'll have like a stern look on my face. And I'll say, do you know what? She said, what? Your daddy loves you so much. And she gets a big old smile on her face. <laughs> and she'll say, I love you, daddy. But there's authority. When Jesus spoke, there was something different. He wasn't just reading the word. He was the word. And the word is life. The word is power. The word is health to our body. It's strength to our bones. It cuts going in. It cuts going out. It divides between soul and spirit, between mind and and, and the flesh. It, 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 It knows you better than you know yourself. So when you hear the word and it begins to resonate with you, it's because the word of God is alive. And there is not Hebrews chapter four tells us there's nothing hidden from the Lord, but everything is naked and exposed to the word of God. So that's why you get that, that feeling because God is speaking to you. Imagine that. Imagine the one who created the heavens and the earth taking time to reach out to you and to speak to you. Some people don't could they couldn't care less. They they will ev- they will never step foot in the house of the Lord. When they hear, you know, if you if you read through the the um the the thread where I was called a cult leader, um, if you're if it, <sighs> how do you say that if, if you're spiritually mature, that might discourage you. No, in, immature, spiritually immature, I should say, sorry. Spiritually immature. Good thing I have like a rewind button that went back and like. <laughs> for the spiritually, uh, maybe the, like new uh, Christians, they'd be like thinking, oh my goodness, don't talk about my past. Even you should probably think of that way anyway. Don't talk about my past that way. But you're like saying like, you're like looking for the knives in the drawer. <laughs> like don't, you, you, where does this person live? But realize those voices are only, they're only, they're only a reaction to what we're doing here at Joy Church. Amen. It's a reaction trying to get the source, the one who's speaking. We are speaking the word of God. We are sharing the word of God. And the devil hates you. He doesn't just hate it. He hates you. And once you get that, once you realize that you're, you're, You've got, a, you've got a target on your back. And some people won't get saved or they won't follow the instruction of God because they, they know that. But if you realize that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and anything that comes to oppose you is actually opposing Christ, anything that comes against the message that you bring is coming against Christ. Anyone who comes and opposes you is opposing Christ. Jesus said that. Hopefully we can get there really quick for the teens getting here. And so to take it as a badge of honor rather than 
milling around with it and like being discouraged. I kind of had fun with it. I don't know if you saw my comment. Because I want people to know, I wasn't saying that to that person. I was saying it for people who was going to read it who don't like church. Maybe they, they're, they're, they're either they're curious about God or they want a relationship with God, but they don't like the church. And they see a pastor go on there and say that. Like, not, not, a, not even offended at all. Just So the, the, the comment was, it's right here. Stay away from Joy Ministries and the cult of Brandon Myers with like 10 exclamation points. And then someone said, that sounds interesting. Go on with like a smiley face. People love, love like a, a, a train wreck, right? And then I piped in and I said, hey, thanks for the recommendation. Sounds like you had a five-star experience at Joy Christian Ministries. And I tagged the church. And so anyone, and it's funny because that we've been working toward 300 subscriptions on, on uh, YouTube. And it wasn't until after that that people went to go look at our content and they heard some good stuff and they wanted to, to connect with it and to hear more. So they hit the subscribe button and we hit our 300 mark. Thank you, devil. Keep the devil around for something. Devil's good for something, I guess. You're looking for subscriptions. He'll be the voice of, uh, I don't know, antagonism. So I'm not, I'm not afraid. I, I, church, like, don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be afraid of what he could do. That's fear, right? Fear is like hypothetical. What could possibly happen? No one's really, rarely ever afraid of what actually did happen. It's always something that could possibly happen or possibly go wrong. The reason why so many people won't get married, the reason why like I questioned marriage early on in life and was like, man, it's like I heard people saying it was a failed institution. But what they were doing, they were, they were bringing uh, this discouragement toward this, this union and this precious union that God created for, for man and woman to be together in covenant with him. And then when I realized that, I was like, oh, thanks, Lord. You know, it, it pays to have the right people like speaking into your life. You know, if it's not lining up with the word of God, like. La, 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 la. What'd you say? Have your headphones on. Sorry. Try next time. I, I want you to I want you to look, I want you to get to the point in your relationship with God. That when the enemy does something, you begin to smile because you see it coming a mile away. Like, oh, my goodness, this is crazy. Like, here it comes. Here it comes. He's doing his thing again. But I'm standing. I, I, I'm rooted on the firm. We, we sing that song, not for, like, no reason. Firm foundation. The solid rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. Like, I'm on this solid rock to stay. Am I, is that just a song to make someone money? Or am I singing scripture so that I can have victory and remind myself over and over and over again that I have the victory? Amen. Amen. Yeah. This is good. Yeah, I was, I was really excited about tonight. I love talking about the power of God. I love talking about the victory that he gives to us. Why did I put that back in my, it's my notes on here. Oh, like the, the victory that we have in Christ. One of the things that devil would, the, the, the enemy would love to delete from the Bible is the, our, uh, the truth that, that we have the victory that belongs to God. God gave us the victory over all and every enemy, no matter what would come to face, uh, come face to face with us. So let's continue on, because Jesus, it, it, it doesn't end all hunky-dory here. Um, so he says, yeah, thank you. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day, Isaiah 61. Everyone spoke well of him and amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. And notice this. I'm going I'm to give you a little uh, prelude thing here. Don't get super excited and 
when people encourage you and lift you up. Because in about a paragraph, they're going to be trying to throw him off a, a, a cliff and trying to kill him. If you can't, if your encouragement doesn't move me, then your discouragement, you better believe it, it won't either. I'm already encouraged by the word of the Lord. Yeah. And you should, we should be encouraging each other. I'm not saying don't do that. That's healthy. That's, that's, that's a healthy relationship. But my life and my pursuit of, of seeking first the advancement of the kingdom of God isn't determined or dependent on someone encourage, encouraging me or discouraging me. And in a, in a way, I, <laughs> the discouragement actually, it, it puts more fire under, underneath me uh, more than encouragement does. Like, like the knucklehead that was, oh my goodness, yeah. It's, it's so comical because that person, it, 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 it's comical, but at the same time, it's sad because that person doesn't like themselves or their life or anyone that is alive. Um, and so I'm not going to allow, it, it's, what it does is it puts fire underneath me to, to realize that, hey, you're in the right place. You're doing the right thing. He says here, everyone spoke well of him, was amazed by his gracious words that came from him, his, his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Okay, here comes the, uh, they're, they're bringing him down now. Isn't, it, isn't he a human? Isn't he, don't, don't we know him? Isn't he from like our block? <laughs> then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum, but I tell you the truth. No prophet is accepted in his, in his own hometown. Certainly, this is Jesus talking. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were, were closed for three and a half years. We just read that on Sunday. Yeah, we read that for, for uh, the offering time. And a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. So there were tons of widows. He was sent to a specific widow. And she was a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. Oh, so now, check out what happened. 28. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him. And this was <laughs> in the synagogue. That was like, a, that would be like if I said something and all of you rushed me and like took me and like, <laughs> where are we going? <laughs> We're going to find a high place to throw you off of. <laughs> that's what it, that's what, so there uh, says, uh, where are we at? This is fun. Can you tell them I'm having fun? Um, 29? 28? All right. Can I hear 27? Um, <laughs> 29, jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to, to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended, their intention was to push him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. He was on assignment. If I'm like Jonah... And I go the opposite way of my, my uh, assignment. I end up in the bottom of the sea, in the belly of a fish, hoping that I'm rescued. Most likely not, but hoping and praying, Lord, forgive me. If you, if you rescue me, like a foxhole conversion, you got bullets flying over your head, I'll do anything you say. If you just, you know, stop the bullets and it's rescue my life. God hears and he answers. Has that fish vomit him up on the, on the shore? He, he does it reluctantly. He goes and he, he speaks the word. But in the assignment, when he fulfilled the assignment, it was a simple word and that entire nation was saved, was rescued by God because they heeded the word of God. And we see here that they did not like what Jesus said and they intended to kill him. 
but he passed right on through the crowd, like, like, the, like the Red Sea, right? The favor of the Lord, preparing your, your steps. Your steps are ordered to the Lord. And when your steps are ordered to the Lord, you're not going and expecting God to follow you. He's giving you an instruction to go, and as you go, he will uphold you. He will preserve you, and he will sustain you through whatever the situation is. Let faith arise in your soul. We used to sing that song. Let faith arise in your soul. That's what's happening right now with you. There's a faith that when it grows and when it, when it grows, it brings strength to your life and into every area of your life. It does the opposite of what happens in the world. The world, we're discouraged. We lose out. Things taken from us, steal, kill, destroy, right? Jesus said, I have come. Jesus said, I have come that you would have life, that you would have it more abundantly, amen? That's what you're experiencing right now. And then we see Jesus, he con continues to go on healing people. We don't stop just because of this discouragement or people telling us specifically, don't do that. No. You don't have to say no. You don't have to say, I'm going to do it anyway. You just go ahead and do it anyway. Just act like you know what you're doing. That's what I do. Like the, the outreach team. No, I'm going I'm to hand out the, the rest of these, these invitations, and then we'll go. People telling them to leave. We don't want you around here. Okay. I understand. I've only got like 25 left. And after I'm done, I'll, I'll be gone. I'll get out of your hair. Promise. Till next Saturday. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you had a gun uh, pulled on you uh, doing that. And that was, yeah, that, I, I believe that was the enemy. That was the devil trying to discourage you. But I, I saw it uh, build strength and faith in you. Because you, you, you actually, didn't you put your head in his car? You went into his car, and you gave him an invitation. All we're, all we're trying to do is invite people to church. That's, that's, what, you, that's what you said. And then he, he, you saw the, him calm down, and he, he pulled off, and he just he left. Praise God. Hopefully one day he'll be in church. Yeah, he took an invitation. He took, he took an invitation with him. Yeah. yeah. Those are the people we want. We want strong men. We don't want pansies coming in ruining what God is. We don't want people coming in and doing it halfway. We want people coming in knowing what the Word of God says and believing that people are healed. When, when you lay your hands on them, they're healed. We don't want people coming in and saying, Lord, let your will be done. If they're healed, then they're healed. That's how people don't get healed. When you bring the Word of God, what destroys the, 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 the work of the enemy? The word of God. The devil himself, like the, the head honcho of all demons, and like the like couldn't even put a dent or a scratch on our Lord and our Savior. But he had to walk away to try to re recoup that like, man, how are we gonna how are we gonna win this one? He never has, and he never will. And it's gonna end up bad for him, like really bad for him. And anyone who follows him is going to end up bad for them. But for those who call on the name of the Lord, you seek the Father's face, they will be saved. You know who gets filled up? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus said that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You're here on a Wednesday night, you're not leaving empty. You may have come in like on, on, the, on like that, the res like dripping, like the drips and the dregs of the reserve tank. But not only is your reserve, you're going to leave with your reserve tank full, but you're going to leave filled up and overflowing in your spiritual tank when you leave tonight. 
Amen. It's gonna, and it's not going to just get you through the week. It's going to cause you to be able to speak into other people's lives. And that fuel, that faith that has been put and placed into you tonight is going to be poured out into other people. And they're not going to know what happened to them, but they're just going to have this desire for what you have. And because you're a strong individual, you're a strong child of God, they're going to want what you've got. And don't be afraid if they ask any questions. Answer, answer the question to the best of your ability. And, and remember that the, good, the, the word of God is good news. It, it doesn't end out bad for, for those who connect themselves with the kingdom of God. But it turns out better than good. Gooder than good. And so we see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just close here with... Uh, so this is the same chapter. Jesus continues on. He's not allowing any distraction, discouragement. 38, go to 38. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home where he found Simon's brother-in-law very sick or mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. He didn't, he didn't say, Lord, if it's your will, that this woman be healed, let it be done. He rebuked the sickness because he had the authority over that sickness. You don't ask permission when you have the authority. If you have the authority over the enemy, you don't have to go to someone else to ask them if you can cast out this devil or this sickness or this discouragement, or this depression, or this anxiety, whatever it is, you have the authority. The Lord has given you victory over all your enemies. Not most, but all. All of your enemies, whatever would come to oppose you. So, Jesus, he rebuked the sickness, the fever, standing at her bedside, 39. Oh, we already read that. He rebuked the fever and it left her and she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. So not only was she healed, but she was in a position where she was like fixing a meal for Jesus. He's like, well, you can sit down. No, actually, he wouldn't say that. If you're wanting to give to him, it's, to your, it's for your good. It's, it's, it's not for his benefit. It's for yours. Whatever you do for the Lord, is, it's never useless. It's always for good. 40, as the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. That's what people should be doing to you. That's what people should be doing at Joy Church. There should be a stigma on this church where people are bringing their, their depressed family members. They're bringing their, their family members who are deaf, who are blind, who, who have, have ailments in their bodies that the doctors have given them no, no good diagnosis saying, maybe even giving them months to live where they bring them to the house of God so that they can be anointed with oil which I have some right here anointed with oil anointing oil laying hands on the sick knowing that they will recover if we are to look like Jesus we gotta do what Jesus did this is the authority he's given to us he, he says here, no matter what the, their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. The touch of his hand. Give me your hand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for healing this body. I thank you for bringing strength, wholeness, in sickness, I curse you in Jesus' name, and I command you to go. You have no authority, but the authority has been given to us, to me, to cast you out, to never come back again, to never return, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Receive it. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. So it didn't matter what the disease was, it stood no chance against Jesus. 
and didn't matter who it was, they were going to be healed. Many were possessed by demons, and the demons came out at his command, shouting, probably screaming like a, a little girl, you are the son of God. And that, that's where they, were. They, they knew who Jesus was. But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them even speak. Let's finish up this chapter, verse, uh, chapter 4. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to, to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too. Because that is why I was sent. He, wasn't, he didn't come to set up shop and to set up a throne in a certain town or a certain city. He came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too. He says, that's why I was sent. He continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. Would you stand to your feet? We serve a good God, don't we? We thank you, Lord. What I want you to do is I just want you to lift your hands. And whatever you're believing for, let it, let it be. You can come on up. Yeah. Whatever you're believing for, it's the word of God that brings health and healing and strength. You don't have to have someone lay their hands on you. Yeah, that's, that's one way to, to be healed, is to have hands laid on you. But also another way, and an easier way, is just to believe the word of God. And as the word of God goes forth, as you receive the word of God, as you consume the word of God, it's consuming you and you're being healed. My mom, when she, when she uh, was, had the diagnosis of a, of, a, of a tear in her eye, she said, thank you. Now I know what to pray for. So she went home and she began to, she sought out, she began to, Re, uh, look at all the healing scriptures throughout the Bible and she would fast and she was praying and she was reading the scriptures that was and she was declaring her healing this is what the word of God says this, the word of God says this belongs to me when she went back to the doctor the eye doctor they didn't know what happened because that what the, the condition that she had was irreversible Either they were going to cauterize it and she would be blind in that, in that part of her eye for the rest of her life or she could have let it go, and, but it would never reverse. It would only either stay the same or get worse. And it was through the word of God and the authority that we are told that we have through God's word because of who Jesus Christ is, because of what he did even before he got to the cross. By his stripes, we are healed. Before he even went to the cross. You see, the cross was for our forgiveness. The stripes on his back that he took for us was so that we can be healed physically in this life. And whatever you are going through right now, would you just receive it? Would you reach up to God and say, thank you, God, for healing me. And receive it as you say that by faith. Our God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Part of that is healing in our bodies. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Not only can He, but He has a desire to see you healed, to see you whole. Whatever it is, if it's visible, if it's invisible, if it's physical, if it's mental, if it's social, if it's financial, God will give you the answer today. And whatever the enemy has done over the course of your life, none of that is too big for our God to take care of it right now before you leave this place. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. Would you sing that song, I Sing Praises? I sing praises to Come on, would you receive it tonight? Lord, I thank you for healing. We thank you for strength. We thank you, God, that you are the great physician. You are so good. We thank you, Lord.
If you need prayer tonight, I just feel, why are we going to talk about that and not give an opportunity for God to move tonight? If you need healing in your body, what I want you to do is I want you to come in, into this altar right here. I want you to just lift your hands and begin to receive from the Lord. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And as the word of God says, the prayer of faith is going to heal the sick. We thank you, Lord. If that's you, just want to give you that opportunity tonight. Would you sing it one more time? I sing praises to thank you, Lord.
Come on, sing it out tonight. I sing praises. I sing praises to your name. You're so worthy, Lord. time I sing praises I want you to know that the flesh, I'm, tra- I'm talking my, about myself, would say, hey, it's getting late. People want to get home. But the Spirit of God, He wants to touch you. And there's no amount of time, like, God, whatever time you want from me, I, I want to give it to you. He's given us this time. He's given us this life. And if he says, hey, hang out a little bit longer and I'll, I'll get, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you something. I wanna hang out and see what, what that something is. And I feel like, like all of heaven is honoring your faithfulness. He's honoring your, your, your trust in him. You know, we've trusted everything else, anything and everything, and it's all disappointed. It, it never gave us what the hype said we would get. But I'm telling you, when I came to Christ and I gave him and I surrendered my life to him, it wasn't just a peace that he gave to me. It wasn't just a a peace and a calm through through a storm, but it was a power that he gave me to conquer and defeat and overcome any storm. And tonight you're not you're not leaving with anything any different than that. You are leaving with a victory. You're leaving with with a greater faith. You're leaving with a, with healing. You're you're leaving with a greater understanding of who God is and who you are and what you have in and through him. And there is nothing on this planet, nothing in your mind that that will supersede the authority that God has given to us. So you got to walk in it. You got to live in it. It's not a thing that we do on Sundays or when we come on Wednesday. But when we leave, don't let it fizzle. But continue to stir up your faith. Continue to stir up that gift that God has placed on the inside of you. Stir up that treasure that God has placed in your heart, in your spirit, in your life. Practice on your husband. (laughs) Practice on your wife. Practice on your grandkids. Practice on your children. Young people, practice on your parents. Like practice serving them. Practice observing the, what, what they're doing. And begin to uh, ask God, God, how can I make this house even cooler? What can I do, Lord, to be a benefit and a blessing to this house? To make it easier on my mom? 
Not that she needs it to be easy because she's a superwoman, right? Felicia hates when I say that. She's like, no, I'm a regular woman with regular needs. But what I'm saying is, young people, look, look at your parents and ask God. It, you're, what you're doing is you're stirring up the gifts that God has placed on the inside of you. And what better place to practice and to put it into practice, but in the home that you live in with your mom, your, your dad, your siblings. As God uses you, I'm telling you, the enemy will tell you you're too young. And the funny thing is, when you grow up, he'll tell you that you're too old. So if you're listening to the enemy or anyone else, it's never going to be the right time. But I'm telling you, as your pastor, that right now, today, is the right time to get started and to allow the favor of God, the blessing of God, to pour and pour out over your life, not just to be a blessing in your life, but also to be a blessing to your family, to your church, to your, to your community, to your, uh, to your city. Amen? Amen. You're leaving tonight charged up. You're leaving tonight full in Jesus' name. Before we leave, I want to give you an opportunity. I just going to be really quick. I just would love for you to put the graphic on the screen. I'm not going to preach tonight on, on giving, but I just want to give you the opportunity. I know that, that there are those watching online who are looking for opportunities to give, and I want to say thank you for those of you who have just been, been giving and really helping out in, in, in the... What is it? The, what Jesus said in the advancement of the kingdom of God. We're a church where we're not, we're not listening to the, what the world wants us to do. We're, and believe me, when people come in, I'm not, I'm not doing things based on what people want that, that are coming in here. If that were the case, we wouldn't be a church anymore. And you'd probably all hate each other and me. But if we do it God's way, there's unity, it's healthy, it's strong, it's growing, it's thriving, it's flourishing. And that's what we, we want to raise our children up in so that when we're gone, they'll, they'll carry the mantle and do it even better than we did. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So if you'd like to give, be a part of, of the advancement of the kingdom of God here on the earth, you can go to wearejoy.church slash give. If you'd like to send a large check, you can send it to Joy Church at 825 Sunset Avenue in West Sacramento, the beautiful city of West Sacramento, California, 95605. Amen. Let me pray a blessing over your life. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. You are such a good God. You are such a faithful God. You have given to us tonight what no seminar, what no conference, what no movie, no television show, no amount of money could give to us. And as we leave this place, God, I pray that you would be honored, that you would be glorified by our lives as we give to you our lives as a, as a living offering, a living sacrifice, a living worship to you. Give us opportunities, God, to reach out and to be a blessing to the people around us, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. We'll give you the praise. Amen. Amen. Would you give God a praise? Have a great evening.